Let me try to email the other panelists again. Welcome everyone. We haven't began because there was some confusion with the uh, link for the panelists. So at this time, we only have three panelists present. Uh, we're still waiting on our moderator and two more panelists. So thank you for your patience as we uh, wait for those folks to join us. We um, just got clarity. And so we should be starting shortly. Thank you. And which panel is this, please? This panel is Catalyst for Change. We're going to be discussing ways in which the city of San Francisco is, um, is supporting guaranteed income and direct payment efforts to advance equity. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, I see um, Josh, which is one of our panelists. Welcome, welcome. We got it together. I do not see our moderator yet. I am fine. So I'm looking to our other um, panelists, if possible. So uh, let me see. Uh, Benjamin, I know you said you were recording. Uh, my computer says I need to ask the host for permission to record, um, which means I also don't have permission to spotlight the panelists. I'm not sure who the host is. Um, but if you have that ability to spotlight the panelists, that the would be great. Is, um, the host of the conference, which is like Louise, uh, Jose, or uh, Edward. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. And then for those of you who participated in other sessions, uh, were the panelists spotlighted or did folks just use speaker view? <laughs> I want to make sure that we're doing this appropriately. It varied sometimes. Okay. Both. Okay, thank y'all. Um, well, we'll, in the interest of time, we'll go ahead and get started because we only have now about 55 minutes. I know we go until 12.45. So uh, Veronica, Mario, Josh, if y'all are okay with that, I'm fine with moving us forward. And then when Brianna and Attica join, we can um, invite them into the discussion. So welcome everyone. If you are here to learn about um, what San Francisco is doing, related to direct payments and guaranteed income efforts um, to advance equity, then you are in the right place. Uh, my name is Dr. Saida Leah Tatufu Birch and I serve as the director for the Dreamkeeper Initiative at the San Francisco Human Rights Commission. And I am joined by esteemed panelists uh, from uh, Veronica, well, I'll let you all introduce yourself. So let's start with Veronica, Mario, and then Josh, and then I will get into the flow of this conversation um, and, and how we plan to share some great information with y'all today. So Veronica? Well, thank you so much. I'm not a panelist. I'm just one of the people who are 
Uh, I joined, thank you. <laughs> I apologize. Veronica Garcia. I see you, Veronica Adams Cooper. Uh, so Veronica Garcia is one of our panelists as well. We have two Veronicas in the room. Thank you so much, Dr. J Dr. Sai. What a joy to be here with you all. I love the name Veronica. I love, I love our name, Veronica. So thank you so much for chiming in. Um, so I'll be brief. My name is Veronica Garcia. I work for the Office of Economic and Workforce Development, supporting young adults between the ages of 624 and the workforce. I also help coordinate a number of different payments for various guaranteed income programs here in the city. And Mario? Yes. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Mario Paz. I'm the executive director of the Good Samaritan Family Resource Center, and I also serve as vice chair of San Francisco's Immigrant Rights Commission. And Director Arce. Thank you, Dr. Sai. I'm Joshua Arce, director of workforce development here at the San Francisco Mayor's Office of Economic and Workforce Development. Thanks for the invitation once again. Wonderful. So I'm, I'm going to set a bit of context specifically around um, a lot of the work or a lot of efforts that um, that catalog served as catalysts, hence the title for the session, Catalyst for Change for Guaranteed Income Efforts under the, the purview of what's called the Dreamkeeper Initiative. So although the Dreamkeeper Initiative does not support uh, the entirety of guaranteed and direct payment efforts, the the expertise that you'll be hearing from today is uh, how sit the city of San Francisco has used direct payments and guaranteed income pilots to advance equity in response to COVID recovery, as well as in response to e general economic development across uh, communities of color in San Francisco, specifically black and brown communities. And so if uh, if my panelists would, would give me a bit of time, I'm just gonna briefly share what the Dreamkeeper Initiative is to set general context of the why in terms of government, I represent government, and then I'm gonna pass it to uh, Director Arce at OEWD who can set, can set further context about what the Office of Economic and Workforce Development is specifically doing to support these direct payment and guaranteed income efforts. Excuse Canva. Okay, so the Dreamkeeper Initiative launched in 2021. Uh, Mayor Breed Supervisor Walton saw it fit after um, to, to make a more concerted effort to um, allocate resources to San Francisco's diverse Black communities. And so as we think about the, the goal of the Dreamkeeper Initiative, um, it is this. It's an intergenerational effort that aims to ensure San Francisco's diverse Black communities are experiencing joy, feelings of safety, advancing educationally and economically, and are holistically healthy and thriving. And so what you're going to hear today is um, about some of the efforts that we're doing specifically around that advancing economically piece by way of guaranteed income and direct payments as a part of some of our city programming. In brief, um, we invest in what we call foundational actions. Uh, these are actions that get at the root causes in order to uh, achieve the goal or shared result that I just shared. In no particular order um, are around culturally affirming spaces that celebrate Black folks. So how is a culture being exchanged when we walk into either parks, new housing um, communities, uh, retail spaces or uh, retail corridors? transformative and intergenerational social emotional wealth that a wellness that is reflective of and culturally affirming to our diverse communities um, growing financial health and economic well-being which is uh, primarily where this conversation will uh, settle in terms of what we're doing to do this work not only in San Francisco's diverse black communities but across San Francisco and uh, communities that um, have been historically oppressed and um, marginalized black centered education and enrichment 
in, in, which is all about um, creating a curriculum that is culturally affirming and relevant to lifelong learners um, from zero to, uh, to career. Black led and black centered narrative shifts, which is all about the storytelling piece and how are we owning our own narratives um, and combating narratives that would uh, would suggest that uh, beauty and brilliance does not exist when in fact it does in San Francisco, across San Francisco, and finally building organizational knowledge and infrastructure, what we may know as a uh, capacity building for organizations so that they may become financially solvent, may be able to take a, a um, services to scale and may also be able to uh, duplicate those services. Just generally what's happened um, over the last year or so, DreamKeeper, it's a $60 million effort, $60 million annually to improve life outcomes for San Francisco's diverse Black communities. Uh, just north of 70 organizations are doing work by way of uh, CBOs. Uh, 140 awards have been granted and um, new city positions have came about as well. New career positions in order to, to have this work happen and move forward. If you're familiar with San Francisco and geographical locations, uh, then you would um, see the orange areas on this map are also reflective of where uh, there are larger Black populations and communities of color in San Francisco. So that's Fillmore Western Edition, the Tenderloin uh, downtown area, and then District 10. Um, and then I will close on this slide um, and then transfer it over to Josh to talk about well, what was happening and, and why we continue to make a concerted effort in uh, communities that have been marginalized, historically marginalized. Uh, one is we're learning and seeing that um, it's necessary to build infrastructure and, and to have an infrastructure in place that will allow us to do this work um, and do it seamlessly across city departments. We are beginning to shift our thinking from grant making to change making in order to support organizations beyond their um, beyond just conducting grant agreements or scopes of work, but really thinking creative and innovatively about some of the programming that we're doing, which we will hear about in a little bit. Uh, engaging in collective impact efforts. So creating a space for increased trust and transparency between community and government, where we can uh, implement non-punitive accountability practices, as well as uh, provide organizations with what it is they need to, to thrive and also to elevate systems level or policy level changes related to the work that they're all supporting and doing. We definitely rely on intentional community partnership. So when, uh, if one of our panelists is to join uh, Attica Bowden, and then you've already heard from Mario, it, it's definitely a priority to continue to be in partnership with community members as community um, should be responsible for driving government and holding government accountable to do better by the folks that we're serving. Uh, we, we anticipate and expect to learn. And so it's important for us to invest in the necessary research and evaluative efforts so we know how to do better if something is not working, as well as highlight bright spots in where we might duplicate when something is working. And finally, the uh, accountability committee. So being in specific partnership with a 100% community board that's in place for accountability purposes um, to, to hold government government accountable for making sure we're being responsive to community needs and feedback. And so as I stop my share, I think that, that that was big picture, high level, what our intent is with respect to doing better by San Francisco's communities of color. And in the case of the Dreamkeeper Initiative, specifically by San Francisco's diverse black communities. And as I uh, transition to Director Arce over at the Office of Economic and Workforce Development, he'll provide a bit more specific context about why guaranteed income, why direct payments in uh, some of what we're seeing uh, or what we've learned early on about why it's necessary to continue this work. So with that, uh, Director Arce, I will pass it over to you. Thanks so much, Dr. Sai, and thank you for the, the overview and from your for your day-to-day -day leadership at the Human Rights Commission and leading the Dreamkeeper Initiative. We're, we're really grateful because, as I mentioned, as our Director of Workforce Development over here in our office, 
a lot of things changed with the historic investment of these resources and the mayors and a president of our county board of supervisors, Shimon Walton's Dreamkeeper Initiative, very community driven and really adding to community voice around decades of uh, disparities, lack of investment, um, even uh, latent and explicit biases against Black San Franciscans that we see in our case with the funds we invest in workforce development with respect to a disproportionately high unemployment rate for Black San Franciscans accompanied by income and wealth gaps. The fact is that the community voice is very powerful and the data backs it up. We, we think that's really important, I think, for how we invest these resources and, and a lot of what we do at our office is to talk with advocates and leaders from other cities to learn from other cities like you all on here. And we look forward to the conversation, but also to share because this is this is unique. It's also very um, being rooted in community backed by data, by policy, by all the legal considerations necessary to move with this kind of intentionality is, is, is really special and we're honored to be a part of it. I'm here with our Deputy Director, Janan Howell, of course, Veronica Garcia, who you're gonna hear from um, soon in our Young Adult Program, along with our Young Adult Program Manager, Ren Floyd Rodriguez, is on as well as I know that Glenn Eagleson with our Policy and Planning Team and Adrian Owens with our Adult Programs Team. What we do, I'm gonna overview in just about a, a minute, I suppose, or 90 seconds overview, and then kind of share what that means with these Dreamkeeper investments in terms of our ability to support guaranteed income programs uh, to connect to efforts to, to advance and establish universal basic income, or I think more specifically to what we do with these resources in the workforce development context is best summarized by our mayor, Mayor London Breed, when she talks about paid training. And in a moment, I'll introduce the, the visionary founder of the city EMT, Attica Bowden, to talk about what it looks like on the ground. So. With respect to workforce development, we have uh, funds that we invest from the federal, state, and local government to advance workforce development. What is that? That is filling in gaps that are not fulfilled by our educational system, some of the traditional employment pathways that don't always serve all of our disadvantaged, historically underrepresented community members, give rise to the need for workforce development. Non-traditional pathways, it's not college necessarily, although it could be, it's training, it's support, it's wraparound services, it is credentials, certificates that allow you to say maybe high school didn't work out or maybe college or community college didn't work out or you got a little bit of it, but you know what, the, the time is now and the need is now in our most disadvantaged and low-income communities to go to work, to become economically self-sufficient, to provide lifeboat opportunities, to earn support oneself and family, but really most importantly, those good jobs, those career jobs. We work with unions, we work with partners, training providers, and community-based organizations to get there. And one of the things that can't happen, uh, certainly pre-pandemic here in San Francisco, and, and it's happening again once more in, in, in cities and probably many of yours, you're seeing this return to some of what we saw before the pandemic, the economy's coming back and People are going back to work and uh, businesses and activities happening again, but we're seeing the divides. And there was no divide between haves and have nots like that we experienced in San Francisco before the pandemic. It was one of the most booming economies in the world, but Mayor Breed pointed out every step of the way, too many San Franciscans left behind on the basis of race, gender, language, immigration status, housing status, justice involvement, age, disability, those things that make us who we are, but create these disparities. So. The gap for us is paid training. And until Dreamkeeper Initiative, our investments include our city build program, which is a construction pre-apprenticeship partnership with our city college, building trade unions, community-based partners to go out there and get a union construction job that pays on average for graduates 27 bucks an hour, um, which is what they say, what we see you need, you need to make it in, in uh, um, San Francisco, which has that real high cost of living. But one of the important gaps there is to provide training stipends, provide the resources to help take the time necessary for a 12-week program to commit yourself to that. And thanks to Dreamkeeper, we were able to have more uh, cash in hand investments. There's longstanding programs also where we provide vouchers to assist with your, your housing, to 
provide other supplemental, but we've never until Dreamkeeper, because of the intentionality of this investment, had the resources to do a fully, fully paid training. And so it, I'm gonna very shortly here introduce Attica Bowden because not only was this a program where we were able to go on uh, beyond uh, supporting a program, a training partner like Attica, Dusty's Fish and Wells or program to administer city MT in partnership with the firefighter, uh, fire department and the firefighters union, local 798 and, and our office in the human rights commission um, with uh, Dr. Sai and, and Dr. Cheryl Davis. The thing is that this program said, you know what, we're going to with intentionality do something that's never been done before. We're going to take a program that Attica will describe how special it is, how important it is, and not only are we going to recruit those most disadvantaged and underserved community members to help close these gaps, but this opportunity we're going to, it's 32 hours a week for 16 weeks, we're going to provide in the pockets of every individual in this program to make sure you make it get that self-sufficiency a job that starts at seventy-two thousand dollars a year and co one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year as an emergency medical technician or specialist we're going to give every participant three thousand dollars a month cash and here to tell that story is attica bowden founder of city emt Attica. I think she's just logging on, but the, the theory of change is that um, best described by Attica, who's coming on, I think, as we speak. Attica, are you logging on? Maybe having some technical difficulties. Well, what, what I think, you know, as folks know, you always want to have uh, moments like these backup plans so the backup plan in here is a, a slight audible where i'm going to tell the story through a terrific report on this program that is uh attica is having a challenge with unmuting so i'm going to go ahead and say the beauty about this program and the pilot which was funded through the opportunities for all paid training program is that the students who went on to uh, the program and signed up for it didn't know that they were actually going to get three thousand dollars a month while they were in the program. It was only due to a surprise visit by Mayor London Breed on the first day of orientation that the student students learned that. And so here to tell that story in a very uh, in a moment is uh, our very own local news outlet ABC Seven. That reporter named Julian Glover was there for that day to help tell that story. I'm going to screen share right now. And here we go. These hands-on EMT skills will hopefully not only save lives, but change the lives of the young people learning them. This small cohort of Black, Latinx, and Asian Pacific Islander students from Bayview, Hunters Point, and the Fillmore are part of City EMT's pilot program. That's changing the trajectory of somebody's life. Attica Bowden, chief in the Fire Prevention Division of San Francisco Fire, founded the nonprofit and gave ABC7 News exclusive access. We fold you into a program that gives you the motivation and the inside look to say, oh, I can do that. I, I, I too, that too can be me. The four month career training program is now in its fifth week, providing the students ages 18 to 24 with the knowledge to earn an EMT certification after graduation in May, with the goal of job placement in the city's fire department, ambulance services, or beyond. Okay, you got a job as an EMT. Don't you want to be a medic? Oh, you're a medic? Don't you want to be a physician's assistant? Your physician's assistant, you might as well be a doctor. The program is funded by the Opportunities for All initiative through San Francisco's Office of Economic and Workforce Development. It's an example of programs made possible by Mayor London Breed's newly announced Dream Keepers initiative, an investment of $120 million over the next two years to advance equity in San Francisco's black community from dollars divested from SFPD's budget. 
Mayor Breed surprised the students on the first day of training with news they would each receive $3,000 a month in a stipend while completing the program, a part of a guaranteed income pilot. We want people to not have a hesitation and be worried about if they are a single parent, whether they're going to be able to pay for child care in order to be able to get to the, the program, whether they're going to be able to eat lunch. Bowden hopes her program helps increase the struggling number of black people in the city's emergency medical services and changes the neighborhood she grew up in and now serves. I won't even be a part of the full fruit of what we've taught them, but I know that I've given it to them and that it's going to matter, not just to them, but hopefully to the generations. So that's the story. And so in our office, I know Attic is on, but but um, having a technical challenge with the uh, item there. But I think um, you hear some of her voice in the in the theory of change here. I'm going to turn over to Veronica Garcia to talk about where within our office that the programs are going around guaranteed income. And then I know we're going to go to Mario Paz. So uh, Veronica, would you like to share what what the future looks like for different programs with the guaranteed income? And then, uh, Veronica, it, as you discussed, there was a question in the chat about how did you get the funding for guaranteed income? Or how did we get the funding? Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Sai. Thank you so much, Director Arce. Um, Attica, if, if at any time you can come off of mute, just, just let us know and I'm happy to pivot to you. Um, so I want to share a couple of remarks that I provided or that I created for today. I'm very much a talker and love talking about um, guaranteed income and want to make sure to stay on track. So I'll highlight a couple of these um, buckets that I that I wrote out just in the interest of time. Um, so I have the, the privilege of being able to support various direct payment guaranteed income programs here um, with the Office of Economic and Workforce Development. And by that, I, I mean, I have the opportunity to be able to work with our treasurer's office here in San Francisco with our finance team to be able to make sure that clients are receiving their stipends, their, their paid, um, you know, funds on time. And I think that that's a really critical component of, um, of our guaranteed income programs. So since the height of the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, the Office of Economic and Workforce Development and the San Francisco Human Rights Commission have leveraged their social and political power to create innovative programs to bridge and consequently address gaps in resources and services for the community. In order to humanize the experiences of people during an unprecedented time, the HRC and OEWD strategized through cross-sector partnerships or to design and various guaranteed income programs to reach severely low income people and families across San Francisco. With the understanding that privilege comes with the responsibility, HRC and OEWD heard firsthand from community members the way in which the pandemic exacerbated existing inequities and in access to basic needs such as food, housing, and income. Um, and again, I love to talk, so I'm just going to try to lift up two pieces right now. Um, so one is the vital role community-based organizations play and the transformative impacts guaranteed income programs can have on individuals in our society. Our guaranteed income programs work closely with community-based organizations like Attica, Attica's um, City EMT, Dusty's Fishing Well nonprofit, um, which plays a vital role in the success of participants in the program. CBOs are the conduit between government and participants in guaranteed income programs. CBOs develop the curriculum and, and the model for their guaranteed programs and also handle recruitment. They work closely with participants and put in the time, energy, and work to develop program models that successfully graduate participants and prepare them for the next chapter in their personal and professional journey. These are the kinds of programs that are not based on who you know, but give the, give the participants the opportunity to develop, to develop skills in a specific area to create economic and professional mobility through an income that provides and jewels with opportunities they may not otherwise have had. Additionally, is more, it is more often than not, from my experience, that community is reluctant to trust government. Each person has their own experiences for their lack of trust. This is why it's imperative that we work with community-based organizations because they are on the ground, in the trenches, seeing and hearing day in and day out the, what the community needs. Through my experience working on guaranteed income programs before and during my time with OEWD, I believe they can be transformative to an individual's life and our society. 
or living through an unprecedented time with COVID and increase in mass shootings and countless hard, hardships that affect people every single day. Guaranteed income programs provide participants with an income to earn to learn, ideally positioning them to not have to choose between gas and food, rent or childcare. I've seen and heard firsthand from participants who have completed guaranteed income programs. They've been able to access employment thanks to what they learned in their program. They were able to leave what they considered a survival job to be able to begin a, a career in the field they received training in. And thanks to the community-based organization staff who supported them, they were able to receive financial coaching to, to save their money and have economic mobility in other ways. I wanna share a quote with you I heard recently at the Aspen Institute's conference. My gain is not your loss. I'm gonna say it one more time. My gain is not your loss. We live in a country that affords some of us a lot of privileges and benefits and leaves others with little to nothing. We live in a country that your life outcomes can vary depending on the zip code you live in. A country that supports individualism and meritocracy and this is why it's, it's important now more than ever, ever that we be united um, to put people over politics and increase the number of guaranteed income programs available here in San Francisco and around the country. So more people are able to access funds, resources, trainings, and opportunities that, that have the ability to transform their lives for the better and to create a more diverse workforce with people who serve people from the communities that they themselves come from. So. I may not have answered your question, Dr. Sai, Director Arce are in the chat, but I definitely wanna make sure that we have enough time to hear from Director Paz. Um, and also Attica, if you're able to come off of mute, please let us know. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Say, I don't know if you want me to proceed. <laughs> Yes, please do. Yes, thank you, Veronica. Uh, yeah. <laughs> thank you, Veronica, Dr. Say. Thank you, Director Arce. Um, I want to I want to share some perspective from a advancing equity lens and a community based lens. Um, let me start by saying what has what has been the trend in San Francisco for the past twenty years. And it's these two divergent trends. As, as uh, Director Arsa mentioned, uh, San Francisco as a comedy was booming, spurred by the tech industry. And as the economy boomed and grew and the city's uh, and county's budget grew, the divergent trends we saw were a growing number of household incomes of half a million and above, and the growing number of household incomes of about 50% of AMI, about 50,000 or below. We saw these growing trends over the years. Middle class, for decades, we've seen family flight because they have been squeezed by the lack of affordable housing, don't trust our public schools. They've been leaving San Francisco for many years now. So what we have is really a classic tale of a tale of two cities, right? The classic. And that's what we've seen historically. And this structural inequality was further exposed and brought to the light during the COVID pandemic in ways that we've never seen before. And one of the reasons why we feel it's really the guaranteed income pilots that are being implemented are, are important public policy considerations that I think we need to look at, not just in San Francisco, but regionally, in terms of how we can address these structural inequalities that we see, at least in our city and in our region. And that's what we're trying to push at the community level because every day we see how families in San Francisco, low-income families struggle and are now still dependent on their basic needs. And what guaranteed income projects do is they provide just a little bit of stability for that family, for that individual. It allows them to be able to plan ahead to not think in crisis mode 
or survival mode every day. It provides just a little bit of leverage for them to think about what the possibility may be to how they can improve their lives. If you look at the studies that came out of the city of Stockton, studies are coming, the evaluations are coming to the city of Oakland, Southern California, other parts of the country. When you provide families with, or individuals with a little bit of that stability, some funds, or with no strings attached, you know, that's really important, no strings attached, they get in, and they are empowered to make the choices they need to improve their lives, 90% of the time they make the right choices. So it means it works. So if we're truly gonna create a just society, then I think guaranteed income programs are something that we really need to consider. Because the inequality, at least in our region, is still there and will continue to grow. We're seeing new data come out in the city county of San Francisco where it's been exacerbated. COVID exacerbated and it's made it worse. Uh, and that's why families come to us and they depend, you know, we, or as an organization, as like American, we had to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars just to be able to provide families with basic things like diapers, food, and some cash. And we joined with the city and county of San Francisco and pushed for a family relief fund under the leadership of Supervisor Walton so that we can also get cash in families' hands as they struggle with their daily survival because of the impact of COVID. And putting my lens as an immigrant rights commissioner, we see that a huge disproportional impact has occurred amongst our immigrant communities in San Francisco. We are, we are a city of immigrants. 40% of our residents are foreign born. We know that they are important to the quality of life of our city. Most of our immigrant communities work in the service and hospitality industry and the tourism industry. And when COVID hit, large percentage, you know, 80% lost jobs, lost revenues, and their ability to survive. And what we're seeing as we try to figure out how to recover from that is that industries are changing their business models. And many of those jobs may not come back. And many of our families, especially around the immigrant communities, are underemployed and they're still depending on us for basic needs. Many aren't eligible for public benefits or refuse to apply for public benefits because they're scared. So pilots that we're trying to promote to support our families around a guaranteed income uh, support policy are things that can really help us sort of level the playing field or provide some level of stability. Again, it provides some stability so families can figure out how to recover and to plan. It's that guarantee, not just the one-time payments have been important, what we've been able, how, the way we've been able to help families in the last couple of years. But we, ne we need to think much more long-term on how we continue to stabilize and make sure that all boats are lifted, that everyone can recover. San Francisco is a very resilient city. I am a son of San Francisco, born and raised. We've seen the waves up and down, and it's one of the most resilient cities that I know of. It will recover and will come back strong. What we gotta make sure is that no one is left behind. And that's always been the issue. We have booms, but in every generation, too many of people in our community are left behind. And know what, no better example of that has been the, de the declining population of African-American Black community in San Francisco. We can't call ourselves a great city if we don't have a thriving Black and African-American community. And that's why the efforts that you're hearing today are so critical. But this is what's happened historically in our city. This continues. And I think this is one way through a guaranteed income policy platform across the city to help many low-income communities and individuals, I think we can begin to advance the equity that we all seek in our city, in our region, and in our country. So thank you, and I'll stop there. 
Thank you, Mario, for that deep, deep community context and in some of what we're trying, learning and, and testing with guaranteed income and how it's helping us to recover and bounce back and uh, to use your words, resiliency and remain resilient. I see that the brilliant Attica is now on camera and is able to unmute. So I'm going to turn it to her to uh, just um, to highlight all that um, Josh, uh, Director Arce shared already and to give us more on the city EMT efforts. So Attica, turn it to you. Dr. Sai, thank you so much. And I thank everybody for the technical patience on, on my end. So much has already been said um, just about the universal or the guaranteed income as well as city EMT. Um, but I'll give you some of the more deeper context. Um, Director Arce mentioned about it being a 16 week program and that it's stipend. Um, it's a $3,000 a month stipend. And for us, that was an added element of removing the financial barrier of a person being able to go to school to get the educational requirements that they need to even be a viable candidate for entry level positions in the allied healthcare field. Um, I do come from the field of um, fire suppression. I've been with the San Francisco Fire Department for 25 years. And um, the barriers didn't exist as much back in the, uh, I say back in the day in 97 when I first got in. But um, in today's times, um, as expensive as it is to live in a city, um, trying to assist young adults, which is our target audience, 18 to 24 years old, the Tay community, um, asking them to stop what they're doing, a job that they may have, go to school for a year or two um, was just a hard sale. And so part of it was asking, how do we remove all of the barriers? And the financial barrier was one of the biggest ones. We are so happy to be ending our third cohort and opening our fourth, um, have our applications open for our four, fourth cohort. And in that time of um, navigating those participants as well as now onboarding new applicants. Some of the stories that I'll share with you are, we had a one young, one participant who came in and she walked in the door homeless. She was studying and living out of her car. Um, it, it definitely became top priority for us to assist her with the housing. So not only through the, um, guaranteed income, but also through our case management and resource uh, partnerships, we, in, by the middle of the program, she was housed with uh, lots of the uh, additional resource and for um, monies to sustain her for the, the next couple of months. Um, I think one of the other ones, when we talk about housing and the financial barriers are, even the young adults who are living, work in the city, they don't live in the city because they can't afford to live in a city. So when you look at one of our other stories, she was commuting all the way from Sacramento. Sacramento, that was where her affordability was. So the ability for her to get her feet planted in this program and then transition her to employment that was even higher than the stipend, we actually got a return of a San Francisco African-American citizen, something that um, Director Paz spoke of as well is that we're losing our African-American community in San Francisco. So I'm just happy that we cover so many um, points in the, the needs that we need for, for this city. And then I just, in, I am in review of applications and it just broke my heart to read one of the applicants essay questions where she spoke of the financial barrier of having to stop going to high school. I'm not even saying the inability to go to college, but to have to stop going to high school because of the financial needs of the household. And that this is a field that she would love to go into and that the ability to have the stipend while going to school, she feels the less um, family obligation strain to bring money in but not be able to uplift herself into a career that she wants to. So um, 
I share those three stories with you so that you know that the struggles of the students are real and they come in even more hungry and ferocious to acquire the knowledge and gain the tools that we try and give them while we have them with us for the 16 weeks. And then after that, they become our alumni. Um, as I sit in my office now, I have a gentleman from our very first cohort that was last year in January. So they, once we start loving on them, they never leave. They are um, a part of our village um, forever. So I think that our, we are unique in the fact of the resource, the, finance, the guaranteed income definitely is a pull in, but they leave us with so many other tools. Um, and I'm happy about that. I am glad to be one of the pilot programs um, under this guaranteed income. And I think that our data and our stories show that the need has been there, um, is currently there and will probably remain for a while to come. So that's our story. Thank you, Attica. Um, we do have a question in the chat. And so now we're gonna open up for Q&A. We have about 15 minutes remaining in the session, um, about 10 minutes for Q&A before we end on a high note, on a celebratory note. Uh, there are two questions I think that you could answer. How do you determine eligibility for the program? And how do you reach qualified participants to ensure they know about the program and apply? Okay, very, very, two very good questions. So our eligibility starts with a pre-screen and there's a pre, there's an application um, that is accessible online at our website, uh, www.cityemt.org. And uh, within that application are four essay questions that they have to answer and those are rated. They also submit a resume, a transcript, high school diploma, and um, they have to be COVID vaccinated. So that's the pre-screening. We, uh, on average, get over 100 applications uh, per cohort, and our biggest cohort to date has been 18 participants. So everybody doesn't get in, everybody doesn't make it to the interview phase. The next eligibility is to sit for a panel interview. We ask them a few more questions, um, and we also have them read because we're looking at the comprehension and competency, trying to see what their strengths and their weaknesses are. And from that, we are able to um, grab the group of the participants that are gonna be in that cohort. So I hope that answers, uh, I hope that answers the first question. And in regards to our target audience, our target audience are, um, uh, we definitely market heavy in the Bayview, Hunters Point, and Sunnydale, Portrell Hill, Western Edition, South of Market, Tenderloin, and, um, and some of the local, other city and counties, because like I said, a lot of the young adults are really one generation from being San Franciscans. They're now out on their own, but when they start building house, households of their own, they find that San Francisco is really hard to um, be there and be on your own. And part of that, like I was saying about one of the students of being able to come back and be a citizen of San Francisco was very uplifting for me. So I think we're on point with our, um, target audience. I hope that answers both of the questions. Thank you. And then I see uh, Veronica Adams Cooper had a question, um, which I which I think is in reference to the Dreamkeeper Initiative, but if not, feel free to chime in, Director Arce or Attica. What is the sustainability of the funding for this initiative? So we are really excited. In the earlier news clip that was shared, it was positioned as a two-year initiative, $120 million that was reallocated from SA. SFPD, San Francisco Police Department. It has since been baselined under this current administration to $60 million annually through general fund dollars, which are, um, which is tax revenue from the city of San Francisco. And so uh, as a whole, the Dreamkeeper Initiative uh, will maintain, in fact, the mayor, mayor's office just put out their proposed budget. So we'll maintain this $60 million of year over the next two years, which two years is the mayor's budget cycle. Uh, 
with specifics to this effort, the guaranteed income effort, I will um, let Director Arce or, or Veronica chime in. Uh, but generally, as we continue to learn about uh, what's working, what's not working, um, and, and evaluate our processes, we um, we invest more. So it, is 3,000 the right number? Should it be 5,000 given that we live in San Francisco? Um, we take an active interest in evaluating our work and learning as we grow and um, also scaling and duplication. This is one pilot that we're really excited to support where I'm sure we're already learning so much about what works and what hasn't worked. And I'm really excited uh, as the director of Dreamkeeper Initiative to continue to be in partnership with uh, organizations like Dusty's Fishing Well in the City EMT program, as well as the work that uh, Director Poss is leading around COVID recovery. But I'll turn it to Josh in terms of the uh, funding sustainability work. Definitely. Thank you, Dr. Sai, and, and, and thank you, Attica, for sharing uh, directly because we very much hope to continue to make the investment. In fact, there's opportunity to the question from Yelena about the ability to expand. I think uh, it's a very timely question because I think Attica has a vision she's re very recently shared with us to potentially expand as early as next year. So that's terrific. And there's other programs. There's a um, beauty academy program through a community partner named Inner City Youth that has a paid training component that we support with the uh, to accompany a program grant they have with our our young adult department of children, youth, and families. And the other thing, just to say before going to any other questions, I want to make sure we have time for the close that Dr. Sai mentioned. But the fact is that Dreamkeeper also represents an intentionality that. Uh, has has been stated by Dr. Sai's partner, Director Davis, at the Human Rights Commission. It's a strategy, a racial equity strategy that we can employ and use to lift all boats. And so we follow community voice, we listen community voice, follow the data, and you can see other disparities. Um, for example, I'm I'm a third generation Mexican American, and 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 when we're in community, sometimes questions are talked about. What's what? Let's look at our narrative within our community, within the Latino community. It's not necessarily the same unemployment gap because actually looking back the past five years, unemployment rate for Latino community members is roughly the same as a citywide average. But when you follow the data and listen to community voice, that becomes triple the average unemployment rate, uh, rate for the city and county when you look at those community members who may not have federal work authorization. So now the narrative becomes how do we support our immigrant workforce irrespective of work authorization? And that leads to investments like two pilots we have in our program, immigrant worker co-ops to support job seekers irrespective of work authorization because they're working as owner operators. There's no need to, um, you know, to even go in through a process of applying for work or whatever uh, causes analysis to look through um, the, uh, the different authorizations or things that, that are requirements because of Congress's years and decades of failure to act on comprehensive immigration reform because they're working as owner operators and they get in a guaranteed income through that pathway. So I think there's lots of ways you can take the conversation and Dreamkeeper and being a landmark for us is really a way to help to lift all boats. Thank you. I don't see any more questions in the chat. So I want to turn it back to our panelists uh, before we close out with a, a celebratory video. If our panelists can offer perhaps 20 to 30 seconds of a call to action, we've talked about uh, why guaranteed income and direct payments talked a little bit about what we're doing in those efforts and, and how how is how we're doing it. Uh, we're going to close on how it went or what we've learned in the, through a celebratory video. But if I can look to our panelists, what is the call to action for those the different cities or counties, different states that may be represented in this room at this time? Uh, I will go to Mario first. Thank you. And I, I think we're at the community level, we're going to continue to advocate and push for a more classic universal basic income uh, public policy strategy to support and advance equity and address the issue, the growing income inequality in our city and our region. I think that's going to be really critical. We're working with several coalitions. We're going to look at ballot measures. Uh, but I think it's going to be really critical that we advance this uh, it, again, in the context of the growing inequality in, in our city and our region. So 
We're gonna fight hard for this. So I encourage you to get organized in your communities. We think it's a sound public policy strategy to ameliorate, again, poverty. Um, it's being proven, the data that's coming out regionally and internationally as well is very, very promising. So I consider that you to research, research all the data that's coming out and, and hopefully we can push this through. So thank you. Thank you, Veronica. Thank you, Dr. Sai. I'm not gonna be 30 seconds. I'll be like 60 seconds. <laughs> um, so I would say just two pieces. Um, so one, invest in young people. I was a pregnant and parenting teenager, and I think very often I wish to God I would have been able to participate in a CETA EMT program because of the ways in which it could have really enhanced my life, the ways that it could have really moved my family out of poverty at a very young age. Um, and I really wish that we had more programs like that. And I really wish that we could spend more money and time and energy and resources investing in young people besides you know, what our capacity is already in, in our current respective work. Um, and the other pieces really to just not be afraid to try innovative, um, non-trending, non-popular things and ideas like guaranteed income programs. I know that they're becoming more popular now, but they're not very common. Um, there are certain offices or, or um, maybe organizations like the Aspen Institute or the, that are investing in programs like these, but we don't see enough of that. And so I really think that if we can increase the amount of programs, um, whether they seem like they're a good idea at the time or whether we even have the data to show that they're gonna be effective, I think that really being able to increase the amount of, of guaranteed income programs that we have and, and really being able to put people over politics. Thank you, Attica. I definitely agree with what Director Paz and um, is it Director Garcia or Ms. Garcia spoke of. Um, what I'll say that I don't um, that I didn't hear was about um, the partnerships. So you see my face, and we talked to I see Dr. Arce is um, also one of the four leaders of speaking on City EMC. But there's so many partnerships that that I have to that we build, nurture, and continue on in order to really, really be successful for the end result. Um, so that's what I would lend to is um, there just like there's the young want to go, youth want to go into this allied healthcare field. I agree there should be more programs like this leading our young adults into other spaces, even if it was just, you know, politics or it's entrepreneurism, entrepreneurship. Um, the, the, the income, the guaranteed income is definitely one of the leading um, reasons, I think, towards their success. Thank you, Dr. Sai. Thank you. Um, and Director Arce will have the last word. So before I turn to him, my call to action from the government perspective is, if nothing changes, nothing changes. So racial equity work requires naming who we're doing this work for. As you go back to your respective uh, workplaces and strategy sessions, who are you serving and are those folks uh, reflective in different levels of leadership as well as contributing to the design and development of whatever programs that you're um, that you're putting forth in and wanting to implement and naming who we mean for Dreamkeeper, that means San Francisco's diverse Black communities. With that, I will turn it over to Director Arce for the last word and also for the sharing of um, a celebratory video if you were curious of how City EMT was going and where those graduates are now. Thank you, Dr. Sai, and I just would say Thank you for the opportunity to help us tell our story and important in that work, thinking about how we tell the story and sharing it. And so into that end, let's hear directly from the students, how they're doing with the follow-up from the very first class of City EMT. After four months of training, it's finally graduation day for these 13 students, the inaugural class of the City EMT pilot program. We just wanted them to know you can do it and let us show you how you can do it. Let us help you and provide the curriculum. Attica Bowden is the founder of the program, a chief in the fire prevention division of the San Francisco Fire Department. She launched the nonprofit with the goal of providing young Black, Latinx, and Asian Pacific Islander adults from underserved parts of San Francisco with hands-on training and a life-changing pathway to a stable, well-paying career. It is a 
program that is essentially gearing towards career readiness in EMT or uh, just the medical field in general. The pilot program launched earlier this year and is funded through the Office of Workforce Development Opportunities for All initiative, one of Mayor London Breed's signature programs for San Francisco youth 13 to 24. I wanted to make sure that we had a program where kids could not only have experiences and learn about incredible opportunities, but that money was not a barrier to their success. Not only was the training free, each student received a $3,000 monthly stipend, a part of a guaranteed income pilot program, so they wouldn't have to worry about how to make ends meet while studying. This stipend kind of made sure I didn't retract back to that, that whole uh, survival mindset. Fernando Cervantes is hoping to use his EMT certification to help get him a job in the fire department. How's it going? Yes. Good. The Opportunities for All initiative also helping young adults from marginalized communities secure hands-on training in the film industry. 